Hi everyone, welcome to the Landscapes of the Soul. Last time we were together, we left uh, uh, Mark uh, with Jesus in the wilderness. We're going to pick up on that and then continue this conversation using the Markan text as a springboard, but at the same time understanding the landscapes in and around Galilee that may have had a shaping effect upon uh, Jesus. So we're looking at the landscapes of the soul from the perspective of the geographical landscapes, but also from the landscapes of uh, human existence or human nature. Now, Paul said that uh, may we be sanctified body, soul, and spirit. Now, many have tried to talk about tripart, you know, two parts. I, I think that's missing the mark. I think uh, Paul is trying to describe a interconnected human nature uh, that is that is inclusive, that includes our body. It includes an understanding of the spirit, and it also includes the understanding of the soul. In fact, the soul comes from a Greek word that is psych, like psyche, which we get psychology, the psychology of human uh, humanness. So. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of how I approach Scripture. I am not a New Testament scholar. I am, I am trained in Christian spirituality and trying to understand script, Scripture through the lenses of Christian spirituality. So the body, if we think about it for a moment, that's how we engage the world, the external world, through our senses. Uh, it's called sense experience. We experience the world uh, through our senses. Uh, we experience God uh, through, uh, through the body, the external understanding of what religion teaches, what we think our theology means. It's penetrating through the senses and it affects the, the soul. We'll talk about that in a moment. So Paul said, we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable worship. It's the worship. Our body is the means by which we worship in spirit and in truth. People worship in many ways. Some lift their hands while they, while they pray. Some make the sign of the cross. Some genuflect. Some hold their hands together. There, uh, some dance to, as an expression of, of their body's uh, worship of God. Uh, there are many, many forms that the body can do to enhance their worship experience. So the body is how we experience the external world. It is the information that flows from uh, the world into our, into our body through the brain, into the mind, and so on and so forth. Now the soul uh, is the, the psyche part of our existence. The soul, uh, says Paul, is made up of mind. Uh, it is made up of uh, volition. Uh, it is made up of uh, our, our, our effect, the, the heart, the heart language, the, in, the inside of us. So the, the soul then is being penetrated by external uh, inflow of information, external inflow of data, uh, education, all those things flow through the body and then our mind processes that and it has an effect upon what choices we make, how we exercise our free will and the emotions that we might feel about certain things happening like panic, uh, excitement, joy, sadness, all those things are being penetrated by external factors. Now the spirit, on the other hand, is that part of us that is what I call the uh, God consciousness or the uh, spiritual experience, as some call a mystical experience. But mystical is a frightening word for so many, but it, all, it, all it really means is to have a direct experience of God uh, not through the process of the body or the soul, but it's coming from a God awareness or 
in Christian spirituality, we would say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then penetrates our spirit. It heals the spirit. Only spirit can heal spirit. Only spirit can illumine the spirit. And then the spirit uh, begins to impact the soul. So that now the soul is set up as a battle. There's a battle between our external influences and our internal awareness of God's consciousness, internal awareness of values, those sorts of things. So this is what Paul is trying to teach us. And so when we look at the Gospels of Mark, uh, I'm using that framework. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. That's my framework by which I understand because there are times when I read scripture, I want to use my intellect. I want to use my my brain, so to speak, to process information and do some research and dig deeper, understanding the, the, the language, understanding the culture, understanding the historical situation so that I can better understand what Scripture is saying. But when I'm praying with Scripture, when I'm using Lexio Divina, for example, I'm allowing the Spirit to bring to the, my spirit a, an awareness, a consciousness of God, so that the questions that I'm asking when I'm praying scripture is, uh, God, what are you asking me to do? How, how are you affecting my life so that I can live my life? And what I find sometimes is that the external world that's penetrating and the internal world of the spirit penetrating, sometimes there's a conflict there. And so I have to discern the discerning of the spirits. I have to exercise the gifts of the spirit and the fruits of the Spirit to be able to unpack uh, my understanding because more often than not when I'm paying attention to God and I'm paying attention to how I'm reading Scripture spiritually, it transforms. And that's what Paul said, present your body a living sacrifice, which is reasonable, and be not conformed to the world. All that external stuff that's going on, don't be conformed to that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But to be transformed by the renewing of your mind is the work of the Spirit that flows into our spirit, creating a consciousness of God, an awareness of God. And then we begin to, our soul then begins to be shaped, our mind. That's what Paul means when he says, uh, set your mind on things above. He's not talking about up there. He's talking about this God consciousness, the Spirit that is uh, showing us and revealing Oftentimes, however, I do want to uh, speak to this caveat. Some people will take that to mean that is normative for everybody. Sometimes God shows us things about what, how we should need to live our lives or how we're being led. That's for us, not for us to make it a doctrine or a belief because then, then you've entered into the external world and you're trying to shape someone else by your, your internal lenses in which you understand Scripture. So that's the framework by which I understand Scripture. As I said last time we were together, uh, we left Jesus in the wilderness. But he does come out of the wilderness. Uh, and when he comes out of the wilderness, I want to leap to uh, Matthew and, and take a look at Matthew. Because it gives us a little more information than Mark does. So in Matthew, uh, again, uh, when Jesus comes out of the wilderness... By the way, I do want to emphasize uh, what we talked about last time. The wilderness experience is, uh, is a gift from the Spirit. You remember Jesus receives the Spirit and then he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And when Jesus is in the wilderness, now think about the desert experience. Now, I've been in the desert plenty of times. And you really have to plan ahead if you're going to spend some time in the desert because you have to have water, you have to have food, uh, you have to understand how quickly you can dehydrate. Uh, there's, you, you just can't run to the local market in the desert. You're in the desert, it's arid, uh, it is uh, desolate. And when Jesus is in the desert, uh, he is coming to terms with his identity because he's had this spiritual experience this direct encounter with his father God and now he's in the desert sorting out the meaning of all this and then in the temptation as you heard uh, if you read the passage uh, Satan is tempting Jesus externally 
you, you have to eat this bread. If you can do this, if you're the son of God, you can change all these rocks in the bread and feed people. Uh, I will make you powerful. I'll set you up on a pinnacle and all the world will adore you if you bow down and worship me. So, you know, he's being tempted, but internally the spirit is showing him that man does not live by bread alone. That power and self-glorification is not, it is servanthood. So Jesus is learning all these things and he withstands all the pressures of the world to conform to that. And he's transforming his mind. And then he comes out of the desert and out of the desert he hears that John has been arrested. There's crises in the world. Jesus enters into the world where there is crises power plays, hair, and all of the, those things that are going on. He comes out of the desert and he begins and he, be, he proclaims the gospel. And the gospel is repent, believe in the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is the reign of God. And so there is now this battle between various kingdoms. Who has your allegiance? Who has power over you? who you're, you know, what your loyalty is. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. So he proclaims the gospel. But in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the Matthew text, uh, we begin to see more, we have more information. And part of that information is a prophecy from Isaiah that I'll, I'm going to read to you. Uh, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were uh, sitting in the land and the shadow of death upon them, it, uh, the light arose, the, the, the risen light. Jesus is the light. He comes into the darkness. He, he sees that the world is in a dark place. And he steps into that darkness and proclaims the gospel. Uh, and so now we have to think about Jesus as being uh, one who is light, both in the sense of the external world that is penetrating. We have to let that light into our soul, the mind, the will, and the volition, the, uh, the, the effect, the feelings, we have to let that in. And then the Spirit, He sends the Spirit upon us so that the Spirit is reinforcing the enlightenment, the illumination of the Gospel, the Word of God. So we see this contrast uh, between darkness. Now, the other thing that uh, Matthew alludes to and what we pick up in Mark is that at some point, uh, Jesus goes... Uh, to the other side. So the, the, the Sea of Galilee now becomes a metaphor for the ministry of Jesus. It is around the, the sea that he is healing people, delivering people, uh, saving people. Uh, and, and so the sea becomes a metaphor for the human condition, or we might say the human predicament, which is darkness. So he, he steps into the darkness. He steps into the human condition. He steps into the human predic predicament and he brings light. He brings hope. He brings salvation. He brings healing. He brings love. He, he, he gives us a new way of living, a new reality that is from God. But then there is this, this uh, phrase that Jesus went to the other side of the sea. And so when you go to the other side of the sea, that is the extremity, the extremity of the human predicament that many, many people are suffering with. So Jesus goes to the other, he goes that far, he goes that far to the other side to reach the people with the good news, the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so let's pick up on the story now in uh, the Gospel of, of Mark. Again, now after John had been uh, taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the Gospel, saying, The time is fulfilled. That's that Kairos time that we've talked about. Kairos as opposed to Kronos. Kronos is the chronology of time. But the Kairos is, 
is the fulfillment, it's more cyclical, it is the fulfillment of time in which it is now the quality of life that Jesus is talking about. So one is quantity of life and the other is the quality of Jesus wants us to have quality of life. And so the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Now one of the first things that Jesus does in his ministry is he probably learned this in the desert. Uh, he cannot do this by himself. He's going to need companions. He's going to need friends. He's going to need uh, people to help him uh, proclaim this kingdom. And so as he's going along the Sea of Galilee, remember the human condition, the darkness, he sees Simon and Andrew and his brother, Simon casting nets into the sea. And they were fishermen. So Jesus takes ordinary things that we do. Now, not everybody's a fisherman, but think about your own situation. Some of us are teachers, some of us are laborers, some of us are nurses, doctors. We have all different kinds of... So Jesus meets us where we are and calls us not to leave, but to exercise the gifts and skills that we have sort of in the natural world, and he turns it to, into a possible ministry way of doing things. So he says, come on. I'm going to make you fishers of men, not just fish for fish, but fishers of men. I'm going to do something with you. And so he calls his disciples. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that when Andrew and Peter go to their father and tell him that they're, they're going to go and follow Jesus now, and the father's in the boat, he's doing what? He's mending the nets. Mending the nets. And in one sense, Jesus seizes upon that mending or knitting and says, this is how I'm going to present the gospel. I'm going to mend the wounds. I'm going to mend the broken heart. I'm going to mend the darkness by bringing light. So this understanding of mending or healing is more than just physical healing. It is the internal, that spirit heals the spirit, spirit heals the mind, spirit heals the soul. So come and make me, I'll make you fishers of men. I'm going to close and we'll pick up on this next time when we gather together. Uh, so now, when I was a young man, my dad used to take me fishing. And my, some of you know and some of you don't know, my dad was deaf. He couldn't hear, and, but he could, he could sense when there was loud noise. And we would walk toward the a lake that we were going to fish. He'd have his pole, our poles and the tackle. And I'm just a little kid. I, I don't remember, seven to eight years old. I don't know. But I'm playing, jumping up and down, making all kind of noise. And he, he, I remember he touched my shoulders. We got close to the water. He, he touched my shoulder. And I looked at him. He said, shh, don't scare the fish. Shh. Don't scare the fish. So that's the first thing I think Jesus would have taught his disciples. I'm going to make you fishers of men. We're not out to scare people. We are out to mend them. So we have to present the gospel in a way that is wholesome, healthy, healing, connected, interconnected, human, uh, that speaks to the human condition, that speaks to the darkness. Shh! Don't scare the fish. Sometimes we become so enthusiastic about our faith, we just kind of blurt things out, or we try to push our agenda, and, and we actually scare the fish. They just don't want anything to do with that. So I said, don't, don't scare the fish. And then once we uh, started fishing, uh, we weren't catching anything. And I remember my dad saying, well, you have to place your pole, or in this case, you have to place your nets where the fish swim. You're not going to catch fish if you're over here where there are no fish. you got to go where the fish are. In other words, we got to go where people live, where they exist, where they hurt. We have to feed the people. We have to bring healing to them. We've got to be a part of the healing solution of humanity itself. And so, shh, don't scare the fish. Cast your nets in the place where the fish are fishing. But think about that for a moment. Suppose you cast a net, but it wasn't mended. It was fragmented. It was torn. 
and you cast that net into where the fish are swimming, guess what's going to happen? Those fish are going to escape. So in order to cast ourselves into places where people live and exist and have their being, we ourselves have to be mended. We have to be healed. We have to be whole. We have to be holy. We have to be joyful. We have to be connected to the human condition and we need to be healed and whole. And we're not healed and whole by being better than others or being holier than others. We become healed and whole when we understand the struggles that we go through are the same struggles that humans go through and we are able to share our struggles. We're able to share our pain. We're able to share our failures in such a way that gives people hope that there is hope for them. There is healing for them. There is light. Jesus is the light that shines in darkness and Jesus has arisen to be the light of the world. We'll pick up on this again next time we're together. God bless. So from my heart to your heart, may God's peace be with you. Amen.